episode of Ascend, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. Today, uh, our program is focused on autism and managing anxiety. But before I begin, I need to ask Will, what's with your shirt? Oh, this, week's shir this week's shirt is my best buddy's friendship walk shirt. I got it from said, said friendship walk. I was also, I was at their Game Changer last night where our recurring guest John Hammond won an, was the MC and, and won an award. Our guest today is clinical psychologist uh, Laura Mayorga, who's going to discuss with us the uh, area of autism and anxiety. Will, would you like to take it from there? I'd be glad to. Can you tell us more about the connection of autism and anxiety? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, anxiety is something that happens to all of us, all human beings um, on the spectrum or not. Uh, but there are extra layers of stress that people with autism deal with on an everyday uh, basis. Um, people with autism experience sometimes the world as very overwhelming and charged with sensation. Sensations can be very, very intense. And when, when the sensory systems feel overwhelmed because maybe one hears every sound in the room, not just talking, but other background noises, it feels confusing, it feels overwhelming. Uh, other sensory systems may also feel overwhelmed, so this creates anxiety. Um, my background in working somatically with the body is primarily having to do with working with trauma and somatics, but when the world overwhelms one, and intrudes upon one all the time, one feels a little bit traumatized. It's not like a big trauma, but an ongoing stressor. Uh, and so there is a baseline level of anxiety that uh, people on the spectrum hold. Um, I know this personally, and I know this from being a family member of people on the spectrum. Uh, there, let's put it this way, maybe um, lots of neurotypical people have a level of anxiety that's up here, and this is kind of their baseline. And when you're someone on the spectrum and you're holding this overwhelm of sensations all the time, maybe your baseline level is up here. <laughs> and so you're dealing already with coming in with a bit of anxiety. Um, and so that's, that's my take on it. Um, would you like me to say a little bit more about what working with somatics has to do with this? Um, yes, please. Yes, yeah. please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so the work that I do um, with people who have been traumatized or with people on the spectrum has to do with somatics. And somatics uh, refers to the body, mm -hmm. refers to how do we help ourselves emotionally, how do we help reduce and calm anxiety by really entering into a comfortable relationship with the body. Um, and what I've learned is that when your body feels anxiety a lot, it tells you, right? I mean, we all, we're all human beings. We all feel physical tension. We feel that our breath gets shallow. We feel our sweaty palms. And, and the so, heart pounding. The heart pounding as well. And fear rising. And fear rising. And like you feel it in your body, right? You feel it in your mind, but in your body. So what happens is that when you feel that a lot, then the body feels like this is not a good place to be. I don't like to feel all these sensations. So then what tends to happen is we disconnect from our bodies because it doesn't feel comfortable to be there. But people who have studied somatic psychology have dis discovered that in, if you can help the body to feel a little bit calmer and help to have it feel a little bit safer, um, then one can start to land there more and more and feel calmer by doing that. Um, and the, the trick is how to do it very slowly so that one feels like I can touch for a little bit into a, a little bit of calm and then come out and be in my regular space and just begin to touch into feeling a little bit more calm. Does that make sense a little bit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yes. Thank you. Will. Can you tell us about your background and how you came to the topic? Yes, that's a good question. So as I was saying, um, I've trained for about eight years in working with trauma. 
um, in somatics. So the field of uh, working psychologically with trauma has discovered, again, that the body is the place that we need to make peace with uh, in order to work with trauma. Um, in, in experiences of trauma, the body starts to feel unsafe. When I go to my body, I feel my heart pounding. When I go to my body, I feel my hands sweating, so I don't like to go there, right? Uh, but little by little, if we can, let me ask you a question. Um, have you ever taken a moment when you're not feeling stressed, when you're feeling kind of good and okay, do you ever stop to think, huh, how does my breath feel right now? Huh. How do my muscles feel right now, right? Oftentimes when we're feeling all right, we're just happy to feel all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not stopping to, to reflect or get to know what it feels like to feel calm. And so we miss an opportunity mm -hmm. to become familiar with the body that feels calm. We just ignore it, we're happy. We don't need to pay attention. So the work that I do actually helps to nudge the body to feel a little bit calmer and then we pause and we say, pay attention, become just as familiar with calm as you are already with anxiety. You know anxiety really well. Do well. You have practiced, your brain has practiced over and over again how to be anxious. But if your brain becomes more familiar with feeling calm, then it can go there again more easily. So the work that I do is I help people on the spectrum or who have had trauma or both to take a little field trip into the body feeling, feeling a little calmer, to become more and more familiar with what that feels like at the cell level, at the muscle level, at the breath level. And then when you're very familiar with that, you can go back there a lot more easily, yeah? So that's that's the connection, and that's how I came to it. Yeah. Have you worked with students with autism before? I definitely have worked with students with autism before. Um, there is, again, the, the general um, baseline of high anxiety is something that I have encountered again and again with students who are on the spectrum. And it is something that... Um, needs to be worked with from a body perspective, like I was explaining, to become more and more familiar with feeling calm, but also with a student who is, say, in a, in a general education scenario, if they're you know in college, since I know that uh, we're all adults and thinking about uh, adult needs on the spectrum, if you're going to uh, you know, learn a craft at a school or if you're going to the university and you encounter a set of peers that uh, feel like they're very different from you, that are hard to approach because of social anxiety, those are all, all issues that I work with uh, with my clients. And I teach my clients skills to help themselves to calm a little bit so that it becomes a little bit easier uh, to be in those environments where there are lots of neurotypicals. In addition, I also do advocacy work for my uh, clients to work along with uh, uh, student disability services so that accommodations can also be made as needed. So it's kind of like a little bit of a give and take, you know, help to change the environmental demands and at the same time help each individual become more comfortable in their body so that they can access being calm more easily. Can you tell us about some, about some of the tools you used? I would love to share the tools. And in fact, are you all interested in practicing some of them right here? Sure. Would that be OK? Yeah, that's fine. OK, so most of the work that I am doing is based on something called somatic experiencing. It's the work of Peter Levine. And one of the things that we do in that work when we are trying to find a more grounded place in our bodies is we do an exercise where we allow our eyes to roam around the room, go wherever they want to go. So I want us all, I want to invite us all to do that. So just allow your eyes to go where they want to go and allow your face to follow where your eyes are going.
your eyes lead. Your face follows. And after a while of looking around in a very deliberate way, a, a kind of a slow, deliberate way, oftentimes we notice that a bigger breath comes naturally. Yeah. And I just want to check in with you to see if any of you are feeling a little bit calmer after doing this exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then the question I would ask if I were sitting with one of you individually would be, how does your body let you know? Hmm, I'm feeling a little calmer. Yeah. And each body is different. For some people, huh, I feel warmth in my hands. For some people, they might say, oh, my breath is more open. So everybody has a way that his or her body feels when it's feeling calmer. And that changes also from time to time. We may do this exercise again, and then your body feels it in a different way. By paying attention to where, to how your body is noticing the calmer, you're beginning to practice somatic awareness. And that's what the work is about. Who here feels a little bit kind of like, yeah, a little calmer from doing this? So that's the way the work goes. Um, when I work with students, uh, or, you know, with, with anyone who is on the spectrum, has trauma or general anxiety, um, I teach these tools and then I keep asking the person I'm working with, how is it going? You know, I can, I can give you an example. I had um, a client who would get very nervous, very activated when he would walk into a Starbucks. And this client of mine loved coffee and he actually loved Starbucks. Um, and I don't know if I should say the name of the place. But anyway, a, caf a cafe. So he would walk in there to get the thing that he wanted. But just hearing all the noise and seeing all the people and having to interact with someone to get his coffee was very unnerving. And so I was talking through with him. And I was saying, OK, uh, how about next time you go in? You practice some scanning, you know, looking around, you know. And at first we talked about it and the next week he said, I didn't do it. I was too embarrassed that people would be looking at me. What is this guy doing looking around, looking around right? And then a couple of weeks later he said, you know what, I did it. And I realized nobody's looking at me. <laughs> Everybody's doing their own thing. And so he started, when he entered busy places that felt overwhelming, he started just looking around deliberately allowing his eyes to go where they wanted to go, and he started to feel the soothing sensation, which then allowed him to have a little bit more ease in navigating these environments. So that's an example of the tools and how people can use them. Excellent. I'm curious about the techniques in more detail. How deeply do you go? For example, it sounds like you do a certain amount of breathing mm -hmm. and movement. Mm -hmm. Do you actually get and do like body work? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, like I said, the my preferred uh, training is in somatic experiencing, mm. which actually can include touch work and body work. And I am trained to do therapeutic touch uh, through my somatic experiencing training. Um, touch is a tricky thing in the world of psychology. Um, yes. So it is something that I, um, you know, I, I don't use it often unless I really truly know that a person is really uh, on board with using body work. Uh, but there are other ways to use kind of uh, sensation and not touch per se, but sensory input. Like for example, uh, there's a couple of clients I have who like to have a, a yoga ball rolled mm -hmm. on their back that, that sensory feedback, that pressure feels really, really good. And it's something that occupational therapists might use, you know, something to give sensory uh, input. But it can be used in psychotherapy too. Why not? If one is feeling upset about something, talking through something, 
you know, let's have you lie down on the floor on a mat. Let me roll this ball. You know, begin again, that sensory input, right? It's like, okay, notice the ball. Where do you like the ball? Do you like it on your feet? Do you like it on your back? By asking those questions, the person becomes, again, more sensory, uh, bodily aware, and it has a calming impact. Then the door is open to talk about other things. The other thing I'd like to say is that in the work of Peter Levine, something that is actually quite deep that does not require touch mm -hmm. is working through uh, movements that sometimes the body wanted to do when it was in trouble and it didn't get to finish. So in somatic experiencing, you get to finish through the movement that wanted to happen. And that can be a very deep experience even mm -hmm. though you're not having physical contact with the person. So I have a question. Um, once you have these tools, you got them down, and you practice them all the time, you know, d depending. And you're just feeling that way pretty much almost all the time. But I take it th the reason we, f we uh, practice these in the first place because we're not always feeling that way. But I guess there's always a question. So now we have this, what now? What's mm -hmm. next? It's a very good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we learn in practicing somatically, working with the body, is that no human being on the spectrum, neurotypical, no one maintains a state of bliss always. That's a very rare person, and the person who maybe is achieving that, maybe they're in a monastery in the Himalayas. Or they're mm -hmm. on drugs. <laughs> or, they're, <laughs> or, they're, or they're on drugs. So the, the, you know, the, the calm, blissful state is not something that we aim for. It's not realistic and it's not always functional. Life and the demands of life brings anxiety for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so the goal of this work is not like, oh, now I am calm, I am a calm individual, but rather mm -hmm. the, the uh, goal of the work is to begin to trust more and more mm -hmm. in your ability to go from anxiety to calm, from anxiety to mm -hmm. calm, to trust that you're not gonna get stuck here. You have some tools and then you can come back down for a little bit. Then the anxiety comes up. That's okay. We, we learn not to freak out <laughs> about yeah. re-entering anxiety. We accept it as that's the flow of life. And we learn increasingly to have the up and down and be okay like with it. Like we're supposed to have those emotions or so. But if for some reason we get stuck on a particular one, if it's, it's that extreme that, um, okay, I have to. I have to find a way back to the calm phase or so. Right? Yeah, and yeah. what happens oftentimes is when you don't have very much practice coming back down, you get scared, I'm going to get mm -hmm. stuck here. Mm -hmm. And then the fear makes it even more likely that you just stay here mm -hmm. or even higher, right? Yeah. Yeah. But we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. So <laughs> That's right, true. exactly. <laughs> That's true. But then when you've practiced a bit and you've seen yourself go from here to here because somebody sat with you and helped you through it, you begin to internalize that and you begin to trust yourself more, depend less on the person who's been teaching you the skills and you're like, I've done this before, your brain knows I can do this. Yeah. I've always like, I mean, it's nice working with others, but it's like, I always wanna be independent about it. Totally, yeah. 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 And I think that that's the goal for you to get enough skills and uh -huh. familiarity that you know your brain knows I've done this before. I've been able to navigate uh -huh. this way before, and I can do it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Jennifer, did you have a question? Yes, I wanted to ask you about the idea of social anxiety. It's something that's often confused with Asperger's. Could you explain what it is, how it's different, and do you think it's more prevalent among people with autism? Mm hmm. That's a very good question too. Uh, social anxiety has to do with feeling internally agitated when you have to be in interaction with other people. And I have to say personally, it's been a lifelong struggle for me. <laughs> uh, I could tell many stories about that. So it, you know, having contact with others brings the sensory system into overwhelm mode because not only are you struggling to hear somebody's voice when maybe you're hearing lots of other background noise, it's just kind of stressful to hone in. It's hard to know what to say because maybe your brain is thinking through language in ways that take longer and then you're fearing is this person going to get impatient because I'm not coming mm. up with the right thing to say quickly right. enough. So social interaction 
brings about many of the challenges that I think uh, we deal with uh, on the spectrum. And so it's, it's like raising stress to a maximum level. The curious thing and the dilemma here is mm -hmm. that um, we know that when we can connect, right, on the spectrum or not on the spectrum, when you are able to connect with someone and really, really connect with someone, it tends to steer away the anxiety, right? But it's so hard to get there. So again, some of the exercises that we did, for example, scanning around, it's an exercise that can help with overwhelm, but it also stimulates the social engagement system of, um, of our nervous system. Yeah. So some of the exercises that I do in my somatic experiencing practice are specifically oriented towards um, stimulating healthy social engagement. Can we do one more skill? This is really short. I want us all to try this. Sure. I want you to take your hands, kind of warm them up just a little bit, just a little bit. And then just bring your hands to your face and just give a little, just a little movement. And then notice what happens inside your body after you do that. So when you say movement, do you mean like like this? Yeah, like a, yeah, no, like a little. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. little, little, little tiny massage. So um, stimulating the facial muscles in this way, turning the head this way, uh, is part of a social engagement system that is built into our bodies. So again, these are very hands-on practices that you can try to begin to feel, uh, to help you feel more relaxed um, when you have to anticipate that you're gonna be working with somebody, talking, interacting with somebody. Um, but yeah, social anxiety is part uh, and parcel of what people uh, with autism are working with, are struggling with. Is it possible to have social anxiety without having autism? It is possible to have it. Um, is it possible to have autism without having social anxiety? I know very well someone who's like that. <laughs> He's not socially anxious at all. He's, he enters social situations in ways that shock people. But I, I am intimately connected with someone who's not socially anxious and is autistic. And, um, you know, socially does not meet people where they're at and he doesn't care <laughs> so a little bit of everything but yeah that's a good question thank you yeah yeah uh finally uh if our viewers are interested in finding out more both about uh anxiety and autism and also to reach out to you what's the best way well, uh, you will find my email address and my phone number if you Google my name, uh, Laura Mayorga or Laura Mayorga, uh, and Psychology Today. You put it all in there, and then my profile will pop up, and you'll see me show up there. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Laura. We're very thank glad you. to hear from you, and we look forward to hearing great mm -hmm. things from you again. Thank you so much, yes. everybody. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Yes. And now our book review segment with Jennifer Brooks. Thank you, Keith. Today, I'm here to tell you about the book, A Mind at a Time, by Dr. Mill Levine. What he talks about in his book is the fact that everyone, he focuses mainly on children, but of course it has implications for adults too, does not learn exactly the same way. This has huge implications for our educational system, to whom it would likely come as a shock that everyone doesn't learn exactly the same way and that everyone is not neurologically identical to each other when our entire education system was built on the idea of pretending that it is. Mm -hmm. He discusses eight specific, what he calls, control systems. The first is attention control then memory, then language, spatial ordering, sequential ordering, the motor system, a higher thinking system, and then the one that often gives people on the autism spectrum the most difficulty, the social thinking system. So 
So, oops. So, in a minute, I'll explain a little bit more about what that social thinking is. First, let me tell you just a quick little story about Brad. Brad is trying to be an orthopedic surgeon. He has always been a sports fanatic, and the lure of sports medicine as a career enticed him to endure medical school, which was tedious and difficult for him. He is now an orthopedic resident. Sadly, he has been totally competent, incompetent, possibly hazardous in the operating room. It turns out that this bright guy lacks the spatial perception and nonverbal problem-solving skill needed to function as an orthopedic surgeon. And what a pity for Brad. He's in pursuit of what he's unlikely to succeed at. I know the feeling, Brad. I've done it too in my life. So, although Brad is not struggling with social thinking specifically, he's still struggling. And no one can seem to understand why. Now, going back to the social language function, there is a variety of them. One is communication and interpretation of feelings. Another is code switching, which is the ability to change your way of speaking to fit the people you're with. Then there's topic selection and maintenance, conversational technique, humor regulation, requesting skill, which is the ability to know how to ask for something without alienating people, perspective taking, affective matching, matching your emotions to echo that of the other person, complimenting and lingo fluency. That is the ability to speak credibly the language of your peers when you want and need to do so. Many people on the autism spectrum struggle with at least one of these things. There are lots of people on the autism spectrum who struggle with all of those things. <laughs> Any one of those things can cause an enormous amount of difficulty for someone on the autism spectrum. And now our cultural correspondent, Stacy Kennedy. Thank you. Okay, so two things I'd like to um, share today. Sunday, November 19th, there's going to be a fundraiser for autism at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, which is on 50th and, excuse me, yeah, 50, 50 Oak Street, 94102. And there will be a violinist named Pamela Frank that will be performing that evening. And this um, fundraiser is benefiting, benefiting, excuse me, three autism organizations, which is, um, shoot, I don't think I have the three written down, but tickets are 35 uh, dollars and it's a formal concert and oh here it is it's autism bay area autism society of san francisco bay area and then the special needs inclusion of jewish learning works so those that is what this fundraiser is benefiting so that again that's sunday november 19th at shoot more information just go to um autismfundbayarea.org um Saturday, December 2nd, there's going to be an annual conference at the SFASA, Visionaries Breaking News Ground for Adults with Autism, Autism Society uh, Bay Area Conference at Stanford University at 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and it's going to focus on um, planning for the support for Bay Area adults with autism and related developmental differences. Um, there's to be there's to be 40 presenters expected and about 400 attendees. For more information on that, go to autismsociety.org. We're live on the autism spectrum. We wish you a great Thanksgiving 